Chapter 6. Saphira's Promise The morning after meeting with the Council of Elders, Aragon was cleaning and oiling Saphira's saddle, careful not to overexert himself, when Oryk came to visit. The dwarf waited until Aragon finished with a strap, then asked, Are you better today? A little. Good. We all need our strength. I came partly to see to your health, and also because Hrothgar wishes to speak with you, if you are free. Aragon gave the dwarf a wry smile. I'm always free for him. He must know that. Oryk laughed. Ah, but it's a polite to ask nicely. As Aragon put down the saddle, Saphira uncoiled from her padded corner and greeted Oryk with a friendly growl. Morning to you as well, he said with a bow. Oryk led them through one of Trondheim's four main corridors, toward its central chamber and the two mirroring staircases that curved underground to the Dwarf King's throne room. Before they reached the chamber, however, he turned down a small flight of stairs. It took Aragon a moment to realize that Oryk had taken a side passageway to avoid seeing the wreckage of Isidar Mithrim. They came to a stop before the granite doors engraved with a seven-pointed crown. Seven armored doors, dwarves on each side of the entrance, pounded the floor simultaneously with the halves of their mattocks. With the echoing thud of wood on stone, the doors swung inward. Aragon nodded to Oryk, then entered the dim room with Saphira. They advanced past, they advanced toward the distant throne, passing the rigid statues, Hirna, of past dwarf kings. At the foot of the heavy black throne, Aragon bowed. The dwarf king inclined his silver-maned head in return, the rubies wrought into his golden helm, glowing dully in the light, like flecks of hot iron. Voland, the warhammer, lay across his mail-sheathed legs. Hrothgar spoke, Shade Slayer, welcome to my hall. You have done much since we last met, and so, it seems, I have been proved wrong about Zarak. Morzan's blade will be welcome in Trondheim, so long as you bear it. Thank you said Aragon, rising. Also, rumbled the dwarf, we wish you to keep the armor you wore in the battle of Farthendur. Even now our most skilled smiths are repairing it. The dragon armor is being treated likewise, and when it is restored, Saphira may use it as long as she wishes, or until she outgrows it. This is the least we can do to show our gratitude. If it weren't for the war with Galbatorix, there would be feasts and celebrations in your name." but those must wait until a more appropriate time. Voicing both his and Saphira's sentiment, Aragon said, You are generous beyond all expectations. We will cherish such noble gifts. Clearly pleased, Hrothgar nevertheless scowled, bringing his snarled eyebrows together. We cannot linger on pleasantries, though. I am besieged by the clans with demands that I do one thing or another about Ajahad's successor, when the Council of Elders proclaimed yesterday that they would support Nasweda, it created an uproar, the likes of which I haven't seen since I ascended to the throne. The chiefs had to decide whether to accept Nasweda or look for another candidate. Most have concluded that Nasweda should leave, lead the Barden, but I wish to know where you stand on this, Aragon, before I lend my word to either side. The worst thing a king can do is look foolish. How much can we tell him? Aragon asked Saphira, thinking quickly. He's always treated us fairly, but we can't know what he may have promised other people. We best be cautious until Nasweda actually takes power. Very well. Saphira and I have agreed to help her. We won't oppose her ascension. And, Aragon wondered if he was going too far, I plead that you do the same. The Varden can't afford to fight among themselves. They need unity. Oi, said Rothgar, leaning back. You speak with new authority. Your suggestion is a good one, but it will cost a question. Do you think Nasweda will be a wise leader, or are there other motives in choosing her? It's a test, warned Saphira. He wants to know why we've backed her. Aragon felt his lips twitch in a half-smile. I think her wise and canny beyond her years. She will be good for the Varden. And this is why you support her? Yes. Rothgar nodded, dipping his long, snowy beard. That relieves me. There has been too little concern lately with what is right and good, and more about what will bring individual power. It is hard to watch such idiocy and not be angry. An uncomfortable silence fell between them, stifling in the long throne room. To break it, Aragon asked, 
What will be done with the dragon hold? Will a new floor be laid down? For the first time, the king's eyes grew mournful, deepening the surrounding lines that splayed like spokes on a wagon wheel. It was the closest Aragon had ever seen a dwarf come to weeping. Much talk is needed before that step can be taken. It was a terrible deed, what Sephira and Arya did. Maybe necessary, but terrible. Ah, it might have been better if the Urgles had overrun us before Isidar Mithram was ever broken. The heart of Tronsheim has been shattered, and so has ours. Hrothgar placed his fist over his breast, then slowly unclenched his hand and reached down to grasp Volun's leather-wrapped handle. Sephira touched Aragon's mind. He sensed several emotions in her, but what surprised him the most was her remorse and guilt. She truly regretted the Star Rose's demise, despite the fact that it had been required. Little one, she said, help me. I need to speak with Hrothgar. Ask him, do the dwarves have the ability to reconstruct Isidar Mithram out of the shards? As he repeated the words, Hrothgar muttered something in his own language, then said, the skill we have, but what of it? The task would take months or years, and the end result would be a ruined mockery of the beauty that once graced Trondheim. It is an, it is an abomination I will not sanction. Sephira continued to stare unblinkingly at the king. Now tell him, if Isidar Mithram were put together again, with not one piece missing, I believe I could make it whole once more. Aragon gaped at her, forgetting Hrothgar in his astonishment. Sephira, the energy that would require. You told me yourself you can't use magic at will, so what makes you sure you can do this? I can do it if the need is great enough. It will be my gift to the dwarves. Remember Brahm's tomb. Let that wash your doubts away. And close your mouth. It's unbecoming, and the king is watching. When Aragon conveyed Sephira's author, offer, Hrothgar straightened with an exclamation. Is it possible? Not even the elves might attempt such a feat. She is confident in her abilities. Then we will rebuild Isidar Mithram, no matter if it takes a hundred years. We will assemble a frame for the gem and set each piece in its original place. Not a single chip will be forgotten. Even if we must break the larger pieces to move them, it will be done with all our skill in working stone, so that no dust or flecks are lost. You will come, then, when we are finished and heal the star rose. We will come, agreed Aragorn, bowing. Hrothgar smiled, and it was like the cracking of a granite wall. Such joy you have given me, Sephira. I feel once more a reason to rule and live. If you do this, dwarves everywhere will honor your name for uncounted generations. Go now with my blessings while I spread the tidings among the clans. And do not feel bound to wait upon my announcement for no dwarf should be denied this news. Convey it to all whom you meet. May the halls echo with the jubilation of our race. With one more bow, Aragon and Saphir departed, leaving the dwarf king still smiling on his throne. Out of the hall, Aragon told Oric what had transpired. The dwarf immediately bent and kissed the floor before Saphir. He rose with a grin and clasped Aragon's arm, saying, A wonder indeed! You have given us exactly the hope we needed to combat recent events. There will be drinking tonight, I wager. And tomorrow is the funeral. Oryx sobered for a moment. Tomorrow, yes. But until then, we shall not let unhappy thoughts disturb us. Come. Taking Aragon's hand, the dwarf pulled him through Trondheim to a great feast hall, where many dwarves sat at stone tables. Oryx leaped onto one, scattering dishes across the floor, and in a booming voice, proclaimed the news of Isidar Mithram. Aragon was nearly deafened by the cheers and shouts that followed. Each of the dwarves insisted on coming to Sephira and kissing the floor as Oric had. When that was finished, they abandoned their food and filled their stone tankards with beer and mead. Aragon joined the revelry with an abandon that surprised him. It helped to ease the mel melancholy gathered in his heart. However, he did try to resist complete debauchery, for he was conscious of the duties that awaited them the following day, and he wanted to have a clear head. Even Sephira took a sip of the mead, and finding that she liked it, the dwarves rolled out a whole barrel for her. Delicately lowering her mighty jaws through the cask's open end, she drained it with three long draughts, then tilted her head toward the ceiling and belched a giant tongue of flame. 
It took several minutes for Aragorn to convince the dwarves that it was safe to approach her again. But once he did, they brought her another barrel, overriding the cook's protests, and watched with amazement as she emptied it as well. As Sufira became increasingly inebriated, her emotions and thoughts washed through Aragorn with more and more force. It became difficult for him to rely upon the input of his own senses. Her vision began to slip over his own, blurring movement and changing colors. Even the odors he smelled shifted at times, becoming sharper, more pungent. The dwarves began to sing together. Weaving as she stood, Sephira hummed along, punctuating each line with a roar. Aragon opened his mouth to join in and was shocked when, instead of words, out came the snarling rasp of a dragon's voice. That, he thought, shaking his head, is going too far. Or am I just drunk? He decided it did not matter and proceeded to sing boisterously, dragon's voice or not. Dwarves continued to stream into the hall as word of Isidar Mithram spread. Hundreds soon packed the tables with a thick ring around Aragon and Sephira. Orc called in musicians who arranged themselves in a corner where they pulled slip covers of green velvet off their instruments. Soon harps, lutes, and silver flutes floated their gilded melodies over the throng. Many hours passed before the noise and excitement began to calm. When it did, Oric once more climbed onto the table. He stood there, legs spread wide for balance, tankered in hand, iron-bound, cap awry, and cried, Hear, hear! At last we have celebrated as is proper. The urgles are gone, the shade is dead, and we have won! The dwarves all pounded their tables in approval. It was a good speech, short and to the point. But Oric was not finished. To Arion and Sephira, he roared, lifting the tankard. This, too, was well received. Aragon stood and bowed, which brought more cheers. Beside him, Sephira reared and swung a foreleg across her chest, attempting to duplicate his move. She tottered, and the dwarves, realizing their danger, scrambled away from her. They were barely in time. With a loud whoosh, Sephira fell backward, landing flat on a banquet table. Pain shot through Aragon's back, and he collapsed insensate by her tail.